All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening again, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks again for joining us for today's webinar uh, about grid-connected microgrids. Uh, before we start off with the presentations, I wanna have a few announcements and a bit of context why we do this webinar. As you might know, uh, we are in the middle of Future Grid Week. Uh, this week we have three webinars, of which one has already been on Monday about the rising value streams of energy storage. It's still on the website, and if you register, you can uh, get the recordings via our website. It's definitely uh, something worth considering because it was a pretty interesting webinar. Uh, that was a Monday. Today we have uh, the webinar about grid-connected microgrids, about how to use microgrids to integrate large-scale renewables. And uh, on Friday at 4, we have a webinar about floating solar PV uh, with Tobias Harburger from Continental. Uh, this is all part of Future Grid Week, as I mentioned. Uh, what's also part of Future Grid Week is the 20% discount you can get on our uh, Future Grid Labs in December. Uh, it runs till Friday night, so uh, you have two more or two more days, nine more hours and 18 minutes. Use the promo code FGWeek minus 20, and you'll get your 20% discount during the registration. Uh, besides that, uh, besides the webinars, as you all know, because you're in a webinar, we also have interesting reports and articles on our website, thefuturegrid.com. It's definitely worth uh, a visit and signing up for updates, and you get all this free content in your email. Uh, well, back to today's webinar then. Today we have Wouter and Demijan presenting on behalf of Zone and Eon about uh, their microgrid projects. Uh, Wouter will give an introduction to Grid Connect Microgrids, explain what they do with Zone, and explain you the benefits and the challenges of a Grid Connected Microgrid. And Damien John will go in depth on their case study in Seamrees, where they have a standalone microgrid which can run both Grid Connected and in island mode. Uh, before we start with Wouter, there are some practical details. Uh, the Q&A will be at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please use the chat box and we will help you uh, with any issue you have. For questions, you can use the question box. You can send in questions throughout the webinar and we'll uh, address them at the end of the webinar in a shared Q&A. So also please uh, let us know who you want to ask the question to so I can address them to the right uh, speaker. The most uh, common question is, will the slides and recordings be available? Yes, they will, so you don't have to ask that for today. And then to today's presenters, uh, we start off with Walter Vermeide, Manager Business Development at Zone. He will start with an introduction about Zone, and then we'll go in depth on the market trends and opportunities in business to business market for, block, or for uh, grid connected microgrids. And then afterwards, he will explain uh, on the, by the hand of some projects the benefits and the challenges of uh, these grid connected microgrids. So, Wouter, I'm going to unmute you and hand over control to you. And then we can start with your presentation, which should start now. All right. Great. Thank you, Thomas. And good, uh, good day, everybody. I think we're uh, so looking at the uh, attendance list. They were from all over the world. So it is a good morning, good afternoon, good, af good evening. Um, welcome to uh, the webinar on integrating large-scale renewables using microgrids. My name is indeed Walter Vermeiden and I work for a company called Energy Exchange Enablers and I'm responsible for the proposition we call Zone. A little bit later I will explain a little bit more about uh, the company uh, I work for. Uh, first, I want to uh, let's see if I can move it to the next slide. Hold on a second. Click. Oh. Let's see, I want to move to the next one, but it's not working yet. Yes, uh, on the screen. Yes. All right, there we go. Uh, thank you. Someone was helping. Uh, well, my objective here today is that and, you know that's the, the, you know that I want you to walk away with uh, after after this uh, this webinar is that you have a good insight and conclusion that there's actually positive business cases for microgrids today. It's not something in the future, it's here today. And I realize that a lot of my presentation is, is really as a focus on the Dutch market, 
but since you know the Dutch grid is one of the best in the world, uh, and I guess, and if we have business cases here, then I think there are many opportunities which are very alike in in different uh, uh, geographies. So, um, like Thomas said, this is roughly what I want to speak to you about, um, and. Um, First of all, it's about the market trends and opportunities, and, and this is also the, the, the three trends that I will share with you are the trends that, that led us uh, at, at an energy exchange and enabled us to, to start our zone proposition. And uh, several years ago, we realized these things were happening, and uh, so bear with me, and, and then I'll share you what we see, and then a little bit about ourselves, and then we zoom into uh, some of the projects. Uh, Good. So for those who are in the energy market, uh, I'm sure this is a familiar graph. This is specifically for the Dutch market, but I think the graph can be drawn in many different areas. It's in, you know, a strong growth of local renewable production. On the screen, you see just PV and, and wind. And uh, in the Dutch market, there's also a, a, a big debate going on whether or not we should increase the speed at which we um, introduce renewables to battle uh, climate change more aggressively than we are doing today. Um, so it's, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of growth. I think that's going to ha happen everywhere. On top of that, and that's uh, is also good to realize that a lot of these projects uh, and uh, and some details of those projects on the on, on the numbers on the left side are quite large, about 600 plus, just from the uh, subsidies that were given out in 2017 and the first half of 18, over 600 are very large and they require expensive grid connections. So and when I mean very large, it's two megawatts peak plus. Um, it's also good to realize that's on the right hand side that these projects deliver over 60% of the installed capacity. So they, they're really essential and uh, to making steps forward in more renewable generation. Uh, and it's likely that, you know, that, that those sizes will, will continue in the future to be there. Well, the second trend is, uh, and is about the DSOs and, and, and energy exchange in neighbor is a part of the DSO, a distributed system operator. Uh, they have increasing trouble to actually uh, connect all these solar and wind parks to the net. And these are some of the headlines. I'm sorry for the non-Dutch speakers, but they're from the Dutch newspapers, which say in many different parts of the parts, regions of the Netherlands, we are having trouble integrating the, the planned projects and the planned projects are being delayed because of it. And not only are they being delayed, okay, go to the next one. Where, okay, there we go. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> fighting with the slides. And not only are they being delayed, it's also costing a lot of money. And in, in the Netherlands, it means a lot of money to the society as a whole. So until uh, 2030, they estimated about 5 billion euros and growing onward. So cost that has to be, be bear by the society as a whole. Third trend is the increasing want of businesses and consumers to be uh, more autonomous about their energy. And uh, not only is that what, what business and consumers want, but it's also the, the, the policymakers in Europe and the Netherlands are recognizing it, re recognizing this, and they want to ensure that legislation is 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 changed to support these kind of initiatives. So in the Netherlands alone, it's, a, it's almost 400 of those initiatives, and uh, the legislative the legislative change will ex are, is expected to be implemented somewhere in 2021. And there's already today in the Dutch market some. Uh, room for experimentation. So now a question uh, for the audience. Um, and I think there's a, a little mechanism in the, the, the webinar uh, tool that you can actually uh, 
Ah, see, there he goes. Answer these, these questions. So, let's see what happens. All right, please use the poll on your screen to fill it in and then we give everybody a bit more time. Are you in the business of developing solar and wind on land? All right, votes are coming in. Uh, five more seconds. And we'll close the poll. All right. So that's a, quite a significant number. Uh, uh, so, and now going to the second question. All right. Do you believe infrastructure costs and our lead times are a threat to your ambitions for renewable energy on land? And then not at all a minor threat, a major, or is it even blocking completely? So take 10 more seconds and then we'll close the poll. And close the poll and then. Okay. Wow. Well, that's that's quite a uh, almost normal distribution, I would say. And 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 for me, uh, you know, it's good to hear that you recognize the challenges that we see as well. And I think, you know, over half is 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 really concerned about it. So that's that's a, I think that it's good to know that we're sharing the same uh, perspective on the market. Okay. Well, thank you for that. That's really uh, uh, gives some insight. Uh, See if we can click. All right. So, a little bit about our about ourselves. Um, we are a zone a zone initiative was started uh, several years ago, three four years ago, and uh, we are part of Aliander. And Aliander is a distributed system operator uh, who serves over two million customers and, and businesses uh, in the Netherlands, and we we own the regional grid and um, both in electricity and gas and that's actually the company that does that is called Leander that you see on the left hand side on top of uh, uh, the regulated businesses as a DSO that Leander does there's some non-regulated areas which we are part of and you see a whole uh, set of logos there on the uh, under the new business umbrella and on top of that there's also a subsidiary in Germany where we own a small stuff um, and zone is again uh, a proposition which is part of a, a company called energy exchange enablers and we have several propositions uh, but we're all different but they're having in common that we all believe that the, the world of energy is changing and, and the changing world of energy they all requires new digital solutions. So I uh, invite you to look at our website uh, and, and, and investigate the other propositions, but now we want to focus a little bit on Zone. And Zone, the name uh, stems from your own energy zone. So we want to help, uh, we, we, want to, we believe that energy should travel the shortest distance. So the shortest distance from supply to demand. And to support those kind of ambitions, we have two uh, services. Um, we provide insight, insight into the feasibility of these local ambitions in, in, in the broader sense of the word, meaning we provide technical and financial and, and regulatory uh, advice and insight. And um, based on that, we help particularly the developers of solar and wind projects, B2B larger scale projects, uh, assess feasibility of, of a different kind of solution, a microgrid solution. And the second, uh, service a uh, product we offer is what we call our microgrid platform. This is something once you have a local system where energy is, uh, is locally uh, balanced, you need a smart system to manage, to monitor, steer, and optimize it across the, the various commodities uh, in real time. Um, let's see, let's move on. Well, and on top of that, we, we offer turnkey solutions with, with a variety of partners. Uh, we have some of those you see on the screen, some green choices, more of an energy supplier, 
uh, Kenter is an infrastructure and, and a measuring company and some projects, a Sun developer, and Sun Co is also an infrastructure uh, company. Uh, and we're engaged with many more uh, uh, as well, but these are the ones we have quite intensive uh, uh, partnerships and relationship with. And we're also looking, continually looking to expand that, that list. And there's two key things that we, we are, uh, want to keep in mind. That Zone as being part of Aliander will never um, be involved in the production, uh, the trading and, and the supplying of energy. So that's something we, we partner with other companies like Green Choice or some projects. And we also want to be hardware independent. So we're, uh, we can work with different kinds of technologies, but we will not partner specifically with, uh, with one kind of technology. Okay, enough about us. Um, of course, if you want to know more, you can, you can look, have a look at the website. Now I want to uh, uh, zoom in to some of the um, some real projects that we are doing. And uh, today I want to discuss four. Four types of microgrids where we integrate renewables all in a bit of a different way. And um, in the next few slides, I will, uh, for each project, dive a little bit deeper. I will share with you, you know, what kind of generation is on site, is expected on site, what, how the local demand is, uh, what solution is that we offer and are developing, and then look at the benefits and some of the challenges we face as well. So on the left uh, top corner, we have a project where we feed a, a, a PV park directly on a on the local AC and uh, alternative current installation from a, from, a, from, a, from a business. The right hand side is, a, is similar, but it feeds into a, a DC, a direct current installation. This, this goes for its, the demand is, there is traction, so it's electric, electric transport. On the left bottom, uh, you see it's called P, PV and wind combination. It's strictly speaking, not a micro kit because there is no demand. Uh, yet, but it's it, it does use uh, it's about using the infrastructure in the most optimal way, and the third is a variation on the on the on the first. We also add a link to, to the energy markets. So let's move on to the next slide. So the first project. So it's about 11 megawatts peak PV that's to be developed with a local demand of 35 gigs, gigawatt hours per year. And rather than connecting the 11 megawatts peak directly to the, to the grid, we connect it to a local business and use the microgrid platform to, uh, the, to balance the energy. And the idea is also the future to, in the future to add demand response and, and storage. But in the first phase, that's not the case. And that helps in the benefits there that it really reduces the investment cost. Uh, that's the first bullet, but there's also an operational cost benefit because the transportation cost of the business is reduced greatly. And that amounts over the lifetime of the project for, to several tons. Um, and thirdly, uh, in this specific case, the DSO in that area has a very difficulty delivering the grid connection on time. So it also means we can do it faster. And in the Netherlands, that helps a lot. But sometimes, because the subsidies you get on the solar parks, they have a uh, an end date. So if the end date comes near, then you and you don't have it working, then you're in trouble, and you don't get a subsidy. And of course, that's also we hear you know it's quite an important element as for the business. The demand side is that they can look out of the window and turn and, and, and point where their energy, their green energy is coming from. Well, some, there's also some challenges. So on the power purchase agreement, um, and the, 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 the deal you make between the supplier, the generator and the demand side is, is not a standard deal. So that we're developing that together with, uh, with some uh, outside legal help. And the second one is that this kind of system actually introduces a new role in the market. We call it the microgrid operator, and that's a role we, as part of Aleon, are not allowed to fulfill. So we have a system that can help you do that, but we, we will not, we're not the ones doing that. Uh, and that's also perhaps opportunities for people in the call. 
And so if you're interested, uh, let us know. The second one is, 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 is uh, also feeding into, you know, renewable energy directly on demand. The numbers are a little bit different. It's about 1.5 and a bit, uh, a lot less uh, uh, demand. Um, um, and, but the difference here is it's all in DC technology. Uh, and that has some benefits of that it's, you know, you have all the, the, the DC to AC and AC to DC conversion that would, you don't have to need to do that. And that saves the investment costs, particularly in hardware, but also transportation costs, uh, which amount to several tons over the lifetime. And the same, you know, you can point, there is my green energy coming from, rather than having very abstract uh, certificates. Uh, there's some challenges there as well. The DC DC converters on this, these power levels are not off the shelf. So to, we're together with a partner, we're developing them. And there are some challenges on the, on the rules and regulation side, because that's still in its infancy. And we're working together with the regulator to, to, to deal with that. Uh, and of course, also there you have the role, the new role that is needed to, to support local balancing. The third, uh, that's a, the, the, you know, the, the, the project that's not really a micro kit because it doesn't include demand, but it is a very interesting one. That's why I'm, I shared it here as well. It is about using the infrastructure more efficiently. It's combining a 10 megawatt wind park uh, with a 10 megawatt connection to the grid. And uh, the question was how much extra sun we can add, PV we can add without uh, adding in a new uh, uh, connection to the, to, the, to the network. The concept is called cable pooling. And we calculated that the optimal size was eight megawatts peak using Zone's micro platform to ensure that on windy and sunny days, the net connection, and it's only very few days a year, is not being uh, uh, overloaded. The, best, the business cases versus just connecting to the net is, is also very is very positive, and you know the return on investment is, is up with several point point seven percent, and also the net present value uh, is also up. And there's an opportunity that that you get a better e price electricity price because your profile is a little better, it's a little flatter. Well, there we have also some challenges challenges, and we're working together with the client to figure out you know what you do with your generation losses how. How you share that between the two entities that are one is for the wind and one is for the sun and there's some regulatory uh, barriers about being allowed to only ask one net connection but also we're working with our uh, partners to solve that fourth um the very variation on the uh, on the first one it's a uh, additional one megawatt peak PV with a battery and a connection to the uh, to an energy market. And our platform will balance and optimize that. And that really helps and benefits the client because this is the local sustainability goes up quite substantially, more self-consumption, more value from the energy market. Um, the challenge there is more about, you know, the optimization algorithms that you need to balance the value from the market versus, you know, self-consumption and sustainability. So we're working with the client, figuring out what's the what's optimal for the client, and we and we want to, you know, we're building our software to support those uh, optimization questions. Okay, that was the last one. So once again, uh, the key is these are all positive business cases. They're better uh, than the, the business as usual scenario. And they are expected to to go live in 2019. Some earlier than, and some others a bit later. Um, so, but it's not tomorrow. It is today. Last uh, point I want to make on top of the four projects project which I shared with you uh, in more detail. We're doing other kinds of projects which you see on the slide. We have our our software operational on a small island called Pampas. And we're also working with business parks or you know local energy communities and other off-grid uh, uh, parties. Uh, so 
we do a little bit more than the four I discussed in detail. Again, if you're interested, please uh, look at our website or contact us. That's it for me. I had, I think, a slide called questions, but I think Thomas said that we have, we're waiting until the end. All right. Thank you, Wouter, for this nice presentation. And indeed, we're uh, waiting for the Q&A till the end. I want to remind the audience uh, they can send in the questions through the question box uh, during all times, and we'll uh, address them at the end. There are also already coming in some questions, so that's nice to see. And then uh, now we go on to our next speaker, um, Demi Jampanic from E.ON. He's working in the innovation team in E.ON. And as you might already know, E.ON has a, a microgrid implementation in Siemens uh, in the south of Sweden. Uh, it's a microgrid that can run grid connected or in islanding mode. And he will go in depth on that case study. And uh, we're going to hand you control now, Demijan, and then uh, unmute you. Thank you, Thomas, very much uh, for allowing me to have this opportunity to present. Um, also, thank you, Walter, for the very first uh, interesting presentation. Uh, it was very um, interesting and nice to hear such applications and that you have a variety of different use cases. Um, for me, I would like to go into one of our projects uh, in Sweden, uh, which will serve as a showcase where we basically try to um, do the uh, hardest possible setup of a microgrid to be able to test all possible scenarios. I will go into more depth and also show some results. Uh, first, I would like to start with just simply uh, introducing the company. Uh, so I come from E.ON. Uh, E.ON is basically a energy uh, provider. We are present in Europe and we also have some business in the US. Uh, the business in US is mostly uh, generation business, meaning um, renewables consisting of PV and wind. And here in Europe, the majority will consist of uh, grid distribution. So you see some headline numbers to the right. I won't spend too much time on this. This is just to get a overall um, high level understanding of where we operate as a company. <clears throat> so this, um, sorry about that. This demo uh, we did was made in Sweden. So we have a DSO in Sweden called Aeon Energy Distribution. In Sweden, this is one of the three big DSOs. Uh, you can see on the map there to the right where we operate. So we have south part of Sweden. We have some uh, areas in the mid, and then we operate uh, a small area in the north. Uh, also in the text, you can see some headline numbers of the of the grid. Um, just to summarize, in Sweden, Aeon Energy Distribution has the longest grid, meaning in terms of kilometers. Uh, the number of customers are around 1 million. So some background to why we uh, wanted to test this project. So as you all know, historically, uh, the grid has been very centralized. So the idea has been the same everywhere. Basically, you have generation um, at one point, and then you build distribution lines to distribute this energy to the end customer. Uh, this is now changing. We are seeing a growing demand of connection requests for renewables. So even in Sweden, where maybe the, the conditions are not the best for PV, uh, we are already seeing hundreds of percents of increase per year. So we are expecting this to be a quite big problem in the future, which will require us to invest in a um, in new grid, uh, which will, of course, be expensive. So what we decided to do is that we want to look at alternative ways to, to do this. So that is one of the background um, reasons for us doing this. We are also seeing that customers are becoming more aware. So we are actually having customers coming to us and asking us uh, how we can help them be more energy um, self-sufficient, how we can make them more energy aware. In, in different cases, this, the, this was not the case uh, going back five years. So this is something we think is really, really interesting and what we wanted to explore further. So uh, let me just quickly um, go into the project objectives. So this is a project which we call Local Energy System. Um, 
and it ended up in south part of Sweden, uh, which was a decision taken quite late. This project started in 2014 as a paper project where we wanted to just look into alternatives. Uh, we had a specific case in um, a rural part of our grid where we had huge issues with outages. So I, I know that uh, commonly everybody thinks of Sweden as a country with a really, really good grid, and that that is that is very true. Uh, don't uh, I don't want to be misunderstood on that part, but I think in all countries, even if you have a good grid, uh, you have parts very rural parts where the grid is weak and in such a part we had huge outage issues and the line was very long so that would have been a very capex heavy um, investment so we decided to look at alternative ways of doing this so this was sort of the driver for us to start to look at microgrids as uh, potential alternative solutions to building more copper from the beginning the project was very um, technologically oriented, meaning that the business case was not part of the immediate uh, results wanted from the project. We wanted to see if this was viable from a technical perspective. And then in the second phase, we wanted to check different business model for actually making this to a commercial uh, product. Also, what is really worth mentioning is that there is something called the European Union Winter Package. Uh, which has not yet, yet been deployed, but uh, the latest information we have is that it, it will be distributed to the um, European Union member countries uh, at some point this year. What is not clear is to what extent. So basically, this is a 4,400 pages document, which will be the final result, and some part of this will be distributed in some months, uh, per the latest information we have. Uh, it basically says that local energy communi communities shall be permitted uh, under the first paragraph. And in the second paragraph, it says that uh, grid owners shall in some way enable uh, local energy communities uh, to have control of their own network. We think this will mean that uh, groups will go together uh, and create these local energy communities to basically maximize self-consumption and of course minimize the cost of energy. So this has been sort of the background for us and uh, why we started to look at these uh, new alternatives. Let me then go into the use case I will present. So I will start with just the general build-up of the system. So this is located in the south part of Sweden. Um, the overlying primary uh, substation is a 20 kilowatt, kilovolt to 10 kilovolt uh, primary substation. And then you have one entire feeder, uh, which we can basically take off-grid. So the headline numbers are, we, uh, we have roughly 150 connection points, uh, roughly 200 customers. Um, the peak load is 800 kilowatts. Uh, the annual consumption is 2.1 gigawatt hours per year. Uh, that, that, that is the base load requirements. What we already had on site, which made this a very viable site for us, we had existing wind turbine, which is 500 kilowatt. Watts, and then we had 440 kilowatts of centralized PV. What we then did is that we said this is a very good area because generation and load roughly matches on an annual basis. So we added uh, an energy storage system in terms of batteries. You can see the headline numbers to the right. So it's Samsung lithium ion batteries. Um, this is basically a high power, low energy battery, which was a uh, conscience decision uh, decision from our point as in this specific area we have no uh, real issues with the grid uh, this was just a convenient test location which means that we took the deci decision that the battery didn't have to be too big energy wise but power wise we need 800 kilowatts to be able to cope with the fast changes in the uh, wind and pv <clears throat> What we also did is we added a backup generator because, as I said, uh, we knew fully that the battery wouldn't be able to keep this uh, microgrid off-grid uh, for all time because of the small size of the battery. And we actually run the backup generator on renewable fuel. 
Um, we also added a smart control system, energy management system, which uh, runs this entire system and is responsible for controlling the battery, PV, uh, wind turbine and generator, and also uh, responsible for synchronizing and going off grid. So this is the physical location. So it's lo located in Simris, which is a village in south part of Sweden. You can see there on the map to the right where it lies. It's basically as far as south as uh, Sweden goes. <clears throat> These are um, pictures from the actual site. So to the left, it's a, it's a overall layout picture where everything in blue was already on site. And then we added uh, everything that is uh, marked in red. So what, what I think is important to mention as well is that we deployed a new smart substation uh, to which we connected the battery system, the PV and wind, and the backup generator. <clears throat> so this that I've been mentioning so far is the first part of the project, which was totally an Aeon in-house project. Um, there, there came a set, second step roughly one and a half years later, and that, that is part of a European Union funded project that is called Interflex. And basically in this project, we are looking to involve the customers, so the end customers, and add uh, demand side response as a uh, option in our system to see whether we can prolong the time in Highland. And in this case also maybe uh, keep the battery size as minimal as possible. <clears throat> so these are the basic use cases of, of the Interflex add-on. So we want to, as I said, transform passive uh, consumers into active consumers. We want to create this local energy market, uh, basically adding peer-to-peer, -peer, um, which I will come back to a bit later, and also making the LES a smart LES, meaning that we use all the available resources of flexibility, combining them into one system, and then seeing how we can optimize the system in the best way. <clears throat> so what we offer the customers as part of in Interflex is uh, the equipment you, you should now see on the screen. So for some customers, we could re retrofit uh, simple controllers. So this was well valid for customers that has newer installations. And for some other customers, we simply had to offer uh, completely new equipment because the old one was too, too old to be able to retrofit controllers. What we also offered the customers was a PV plus battery solution, which you can see in the uh, right corner. And that is also one source of flexibility that we use. So I'm now gonna jump into the results part, result parts. And what you now see on the screen are actual real-time values from the first time we ever tried to go off-grid with the system. Um, this was done in December 2017, and as you can see here uh, on the graph, this is a frequency plot. Um, it is clearly stated when we went off, uh, off grid. So at this point, we switched off the breaker at the feeder, and we physically disconnected the Simris microgrid from the Nordic interconnect system. Uh, as you can see, you cannot see anything specific uh, in terms of frequency deviations in, in the switching off point. And the system maintains frequency quite good. Um, I also want to mention that this is uh, the first ever time, so we hadn't optimized the group control. Uh, I, I will show more recent runs later on where you can clearly see that we improved the uh, frequency deviation, even if it's quite good here. What we also wanted to do, <coughs> sorry, was to stress the system as much as possible. So we did the worst things we could think of. So first, we turned on the backup generator. Um, so that basically ramped from zero to 350 uh, kilowatts, which you can see on the frequency jump here. Then we simply turned off uh, uh, the backup generator. And what we did later was we emergency stopped the wind turbine, which was 500 kilowatts down to zero. The system coped with that as well, without tripping. And then 
and slowly reco recover the frequency. And then you can see when the wind turbine comes back online. And also here you can see um, we turn the backup generator off and then the frequency went down, of course. To the right, you can see when we reconnected uh, to the grid system and the system coped with this without any issues. So these are results from more uh, recent off-grid operations. So this is from the 10th of April of this year. Uh, on the lowest graph there, you can see the, G uh, the PV plus wind generation. In the mid graph, you can see the consumption. Um, in the yellow graph, you can see the battery power. And the red top graph is the um, frequency. So once again, you can see, see here when we go off grid, uh, the frequency becomes more stable, as we have in this case of mass control control. Um, I think for this specific case, we ran the system off grid for a full day to get some measurement points. And everything is very, very stable, working quite well. And you can clearly see how the frequency is much stiffer when running off grid compared to running as an interconnected Nordic system. <clears throat> this is also a more zoomed in graph. Uh, so once again, you can see here the frequency on the <clears throat> lower graph. You see the, sorry. I'm having some troubles with control. Yeah, so I'll try once again. So on the lower graph, you can see the frequency. Uh, the blue mid graph is the consumption. Uh, the yellow graph, I don't know what, what is happening, sorry. Hi, Damon John. Uh, there might be a little delay in your control, so uh, just click once and uh, the slide will move forward. Yeah, okay. Then I'll just wait some more because I just clicked. Uh, nothing is happening still. Yeah, then I'll try it once again. So below uh, the bottom graph, you can see it's the frequency. The mid blue graph is the consumption and the uh, yellow graph is the battery power, and the top graph is the PV plus wind. What we would like to show with this graph is that at this point, uh, something happened. So the um, conditions changed naturally, so that the production from PV plus wind dropped from 350 to roughly zero. The battery directly picks up that power, and you can see a small frequency drop, but nothing too bad. And then it just um, uh, recovers. I, I don't know why it's changing by itself, but I was basically done with that uh, graph. I'll just then quickly move on to this one. So a big concern uh, that we had Perfect. All right. Thank you. Perfect. So a big concern we had going into to this project was the amount of um, electronics and inverters we would deploy. Uh, we were quite afraid that the um, harmonics would be an issue. Uh, in Sweden, we have a rule saying that the THT, um, the total harmonic um, distortion, can cannot be over eight percent. Actually, I don't know if you can see, but I'll just point it out. So the graph you are seeing, uh, the bottom one is the total harmonic distortion for the grid, and the top one is the total harmonic distortion for
for the microgrid. But what is really, really interesting is at this time set, you can clearly see that we are going off grid because the grid THP is lower because we disconnect so many uh, electronic devices and inverters. But still, the overall total harmonic distortion is roughly between 1.3 and 1.5%, which is well below the limit we have. So this was actually a really good response for us. I have clicked once again. Perfect, thank you. Uh, this next graph is uh, also really interesting. Um, what I would like to show with this graph is to the left, you have the free frequency, to the right, you have the voltage. So in each case, the top graph is the um, uh, frequency of our grid in Simris, and the bottom graph is the frequency of um, the Nordic interconnected system. So to the right, you have the same thing, but for voltage. So as you can see, you can clearly see when we put the system off grid, because the frequency deviation and the voltage deviation is much smaller compared to the Nordic interconnected system. And this is due to the fact that our battery within this very small area is able to react momentarily and adjust the uh, frequency and voltage set points to have them as we want them. What I could also mention in this context is that we utilize droop uh, control for both, both frequency and voltage, and that has worked out really, really well for us. Um, so this has also been a very good response. So a summary from my side, uh, the system has been running in island mode for approximately 200 hours. Uh, we haven't had one single outage. Uh, we haven't had any Complaints from customers, we of course measure. Uh, we installed measurement equipment at low voltage substations uh, to monitor this. Uh, we have seen that all power quality is well within the limits. Um, we have with this proof that a microgrid system running on only renewable energy is fully possible to implement and is stable. Uh, and we have also proved that a zero inertia system, which is in fact, is when we run the system without a generator, is fully capable of handling uh, big load steps. Um, in the next phase of the project, we will implement the Introflex part, which is the European Union funded. And with this, we will also add um, steering of um, customer equipment into our control system. And with this, I would just uh, like, like to show you a small timeline for the project, uh, which I hope will come soon on the screen. Yeah. So uh, I have marked roughly where we are. So we have basically installed the demand side response equipment. We are now in our test period, which will run throughout 2019. After this, we will collect the results, evaluate them, and then see how we go forward. This is actually a, um, a quote from a customer in Simris. It's in Swedish because I didn't want to um, translate it for the slide, but I'll translate it in live. So the customer said, if you don't start testing, nothing will happen. Uh, this is the feeling of a future. So we have had very good customer experience. Uh, they are really happy that we chose um, this village for this test. And um, I think for us, this was a very important factor because if you don't have the customers on your side, it's very hard. With this, I would like to thank you and also apologize for, for some of the technical issues we have had. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. All right, thank you, Demijan. And I think uh, despite the technical issues, I think the presentation was uh, perfectly clear and uh, easy to follow. So that's good. And uh, well, uh, I wanna remind the audience, you can still send in your questions 
about both presentations and then uh, we will do a Q&A with the both of you. So uh, if you could please unmute, then uh, it will make the discussion uh, easier. And we'll start with the first question for Wouter. Um, it, the question comes from Steve. Uh, in your project, can the microgrid owner still export excess energy to the grid or is it curtailed? So in these uh, examples, yeah. can you? Good question. And the answer is both. <clears throat> so within the limits of the grid connection, <clears throat> sorry, you can export your energy that you don't, first, of course, you want to consume as much as you can yourself in the real in real time. Any excess energy you can sell off to the market. Um, and sometimes in very few situations, but sometimes you have so, too much energy that you don't fit in your on your grid connection. You need to do a little bit curtailment. Right. Often case is, is, is better uh, to introduce some curtailment rather than uh, getting a much heavier grid connection for very few times a year. Exactly. And uh, do they get wholesale or retail prices for that? It depends. It's, uh, it's, it's up to the customer. So uh, both models are possible. All right. And uh, then a question for uh, Damien John. They, uh, did you uh, or Eon develop their own microgrid controller slash uh, smart substation, or is this uh, one from the market? Uh, so we, we basically specify uh, in both cases, both the control system and the substation, but then we had a supplier physically built uh, the software and the substation for us. Okay, so it's a, it's a custom made uh, solution there. Yes. All right, and uh, a question for Wouter from Stefano. Uh, he was not entirely uh, sure what Sono exactly is. Is Sono such a micro controller, or is it a SCADA or dispatching tool? Yes, it's 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 both. So the Zone, I didn't go into detail uh, uh, today, but the Zone micro platform is a a, a local micro controller which manages and man monitors and manages the market real time on a local level, plus a SCADA system to keep track in the cloud, plus a set of uh, algorithms to, to forecast and optimize your, uh, your energy system. Okay, okay, that's clear. And uh, another question for you out there. there uh, in the fourth case, you claimed that the sustainability increased from 10% to 40%. Uh, by what measure is that? Is that a CO2 reduction or something else? Uh, that is the um, amount of, um, I'm not 100% sure, but as far as I know, I think it's the amount of um, energy consumed, which part of that is uh, uh, from your own generated energy. All right, so renewable energy and then even local uh, generated. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so a question for Damien John then again. Uh, who funded the microgrid installations? Have these projects been uh, levered uh, throughout uh, commercial debt or is it uh, something else? Uh, so for the first part, uh, which was before the Interflex, it's a completely AON funded project. And for the second part, which involves the demand side response mostly, that's fun funded by the European Union uh, through the project in Interflex. Thank you. And then um, a question for Wouter regarding the first two microgrid projects out of the four. How do you balance generation and demand without storage? Uh, well, that means that you, uh, um, if you, if you can, uh, that's for the first case. That would be in a second phase. You can uh, you know, do some demand response and. In the first phase, uh, so that would be the second phase. Um, and the first phase, there's it's about curtailment. So making sure that if you go over your peak uh, capacity of your grid connection, that you curtail your your generation. All right, that's clear. And uh, I think we already touched upon this question uh, in the, one of the previous questions. But uh, what are the components of a zone microgrid platform? So what comes with uh, the zone value proposition? Yeah, so like I said, it's, it's three, yeah. three main parts. It's a, a local controller, uh, real-time uh, 
uh, you know, measurement and control. It's a cloud SCADA system, and it's a cloud uh, what we call analytics, which is forecasting and yeah, yeah, exactly. So those are the three uh, main components. Yeah. And then uh, to David John, uh, you mentioned that there's an island mode for uh, more than 200 hours. What do you do with the surplus of generation if there's any? Because the battery is not that big, so do you just curtail wind? Yes, so um, in those cases where the battery is full, uh, we curtail the renewables when we have uh, reached a high state of charge. All right, and uh, uh, last question, and uh, I think then we filled a complete hour. Also to Damijan, how do you explain uh, that a zero inertia system can handle that big of a load? Uh, I, I think that is due to the, the fast response of the battery. So there, there are no mechanical parts. It, it's simply shifting some phase angles, which can be done on a sub-second basis. So it's very fast control and the power reverse can happen momentarily. All right, thank you, that's clear. And then uh, I think, uh, Thank you to uh, both of you, Wouter and Demija, for uh, nice presentations and uh, insightful Q&A today. And uh, then I want to have one last announcement to the audience uh, about the upcoming uh, future Grid Labs. On the 6th of December, we'll go more in depth about case studies around grid-connected microgrids. I think Wouter, you will also be there, and uh, the colleagues of yep. Demija will also be there. So if you have any questions, you can use the email or come to the lab and ask them in person. And besides that, we have the economics of energy storage microgrid and the floating solar microgrid, or microgrid, future grid lab, sorry. And uh, until tomorrow or Friday, until the end of Friday, we have the future grid week promotion code, uh, FG week minus 20, which saves you up to 180 euros. Then uh, thanks again, Wouter and Demijan, and um, thanks for joining us uh, during the webinar to all attendees. Hope to see you uh, during one of our labs or another webinar. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye.